everybody and um, thank you for, for getting out here and, and sharing this morning session with us. I'm sure it will be worthwhile. We have, as you can see here, we have uh, five distinguished panelists and they will all approach the discussion about freedom of expression in cyberspace and the various censorship and filtering mechanisms that exist and ways to combat censorship um, legally, technologically, practically, and so on. My name is Moen Smith. I'm the, um, I'm the Deputy Assistant Director General for Communication and Information at UNESCO. And UNESCO is very pleased to have organized this workshop in close collaboration with the OSCE, which is the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe. And they're represented here today by Roland Bless, who is the director for their Press Freedom of Freedom of Expression division, and also with the Council of Europe, um, who unfortunately is not able to be with us. Some of you may have seen a flyer uh, which um, reproduces a UNESCO press release from, uh, from the other day, and the headline is Internet Governance must ensure freedom of expression and universal access. And I think this is, this is it's really a key issue for UNESCO, that openness, that free flow of information, which is maybe the most eminent, inherent feature of the internet, is being protected and being promoted. It's exactly because of that inherent quality that the internet has such a potential for empowerment and through that also to contribute to development, social, human, and financial. So you would ask yourself, why put up restrictions? Why not, on the contrary, make it more easy, more affordable, more accessible for everybody to benefit, benefit from the free flow of information at the internet. The first panelists, and we, as we have five, we're gonna go a little bit snappy. Uh, I hope through them they will have 10, max 12 minutes each, so that we will have 25 minutes after, this, uh, after their presentations for a concrete dialogue uh, with you. But our first speaker is Robert Guerra, and uh, Robert is a uh, project director in, uh, in, uh, in Freedom House, and he is focusing on, on internet freedom. And Freedom House has started a whole new study which is focusing specifically on the space for freedom of expression, the censorship existing in cyberspace. Robert, you've got the floor. Thank you. Good morning. Where are my slides? Uh, I also want to transmit this to Ing and I'd like to thank uh, everyone for, for coming. Um, I'm going to be speaking um, about two, uh, two aspects of my presentation. I'm going to explore uh, some recent trends uh, in regards to um, um, in internet freedom. Um, and then present um, a global index that Freedom House uh, will be launching come, uh, the first quarter of 2009 um, on how to measure uh, internet freedom um, on the internet. Um, uh, first of all, um, given uh, I'd like to thank the turnout despite uh, the issues uh, in Mumbai uh, over a week ago. Um, I think it's uh, good to have uh, everyone here and I look forward um, to uh, the, the discussion period that will follow the discussions as well. I think uh, not only do we want to present, I think the idea is also to have a good discussion, uh, which is what the IGF is uh, all about. Um, as I said, I'm gonna talk about some, some recent trends that, that Freedom House uh, has been observing um, in related to, uh, to internet freedom. Um, we've been seeing that um, over the last uh, uh, few years that the internet is really um, the source um, internet with, with blogs and social networking, it's really um, emerging as the important force uh, for, uh, for openness, particularly in restricted media environments. Um, but it's also an area where there's some battles taking place. Um, that there's an increase of 
uh, of, of opinions available, and it's empowering citizens to talk about uh, what's going on in their country, and it's acting as a weapon against uh, lack of transparency. Um, in very repressive uh, media environment, um, the internet at times is the only sphere uh, where opinions can be expressed and dialogue can take place. Um, and many uh, repressive regimes, initially the internet was, was open, um, but as uh, citizens are starting to use it uh, for a space for social mobilization, um, restrictions are starting to be imposed. Um, in terms of the different regions of the world, um, what are some trends that we've seen in terms of to the internet? Um, that in the Americas, um, there's, less, um, there's a bit less of a battle. Um, in the Middle East and North Africa, um, there, there's more, um, and um, also more in Asia and, and Africa. Um, in recent years, and this is something that's been discussed uh, both at the World Summit and, and also at the uh, previous IGFs, um, a lot of research has been taking place on internet filtering um, by uh, the Open Net Initiative, um, and, and, um, who've, who've really uh, observed that since 2002 to the present day, the number of countries um, filtering the internet has dramatically increased from a handful um, to 40 in 2007, and probably a lot more in 2008 and beyond. Um, but how do you break that down into a regional bases? What type of filtering is taking place, and, and how do different kind of countries um, emerge? Uh, we see that in Asia Pacific, um, it's highly diverse in terms of what we find. Um, they're home to some, some very active and very free media environments and free internet environments, also very restrictive. Um, cases in point, um, it is well known and well documented by, by numerous researchers that, that China has a very sophisticated um, uh, censor, uh, censorship uh, filtering system, uh, same case in Vietnam. Uh, recent events over the last year, we've also seen that, that Burma basically unplugging its internet, um, and also Pakistan uh, last year, in its attempt to, to filter YouTube, basically filtered it around the world. Um, in Central Europe um, and Eastern Europe, in the form of Soviet Union, it's very diverse as well. Um, in the Middle East and North Africa, um, there is um, a widespread uh, blocking of websites. Um, and, and it varies in terms of how that's seen. In some parts of the, of the Middle East and North Africa, um, there's a nice page displayed uh, telling you that the website has been blocked. And if you wish to uh, complain, there's a particular authority uh, to places where you can't tell, and it's just an error. Um, in Africa, um, some, some interesting trends have been emerging uh, due to infrastructure issues and financial constraints. Um, there hasn't, in the past, been necessarily a lot of internet uh, censorship, but very recently, um, over the last year or so, um, Gambia, Ethiopia, and other countries, um, are, uh, there are reports from the countries that internet uh, filtering is taking place. Um, in the Americas and Western Europe, um, it varies. Um, in, in general terms, uh, restrictions are um, due to reasons of pornography or hate speech. Uh, the big exception um, is Cuba, um, where restrictions are mostly um, but not exclusively due to severe access restrictions. Um, in, in the European region as well, uh, there's ongoing battles, uh, ongoing issues with, with Turkey um, and internet filtering that takes place there. Um, but filtering on the internet isn't just um, um, by internet service providers, isn't also by the country. We've also detected that there are other trends that are um, leading to um, less freedom of expression online. Um, and, and, and what are some of, some of the trends? We've also seen that in, in China and in Russia uh, that the government or, or, or forces close to the government um, will comment and, and, and post a very pro-government opinion. And so the, uh, the discussion that might be coming from uh, independent um, uh, views might be very difficult to be accessed because of the plethora of, of pro-government views. Um, the Committee to Protect, uh, the Committee to Protect Journalists early this week uh, reported for the first time that more cyber journalists or cyber dissidents have been arrested than traditional media journalists. And that is a, a very important um, uh, thing to note. Um, and so given these are recent trends, um, and given also that the Internet Governance Forum um, and the WISIS um, said that it was important to track trends and to see how uh, states 
um, are meeting their commitments. Um, Internet um, Freedom House decided uh, to create an index so we could track trends over time. So we could track how well governments are, are meeting their commitments, but also if there's any differences in regards um, to freedom of expression online as opposed to um, our existing surveys that we do on freedom of the world and freedom of the press. Um, I can get into more details uh, later, but um, um, as I said earlier, in February we'll be launching our, our first uh, pilot study of, of 15 countries that um, we've done. And what we've, are, we will be trying to, to measure um, um, is not only accessing uh, issues related to the internet, uh, but also communications. Uh, so we'll also be, it'll also include uh, issues related to mobile phones, text messaging. Uh, we wanted to create an index that um, was sophisticated enough that as, as we go forward with, with new technologies that we'll be able to measure um, freedom of expression um, in whatever the internet emerges to. Uh, we'll have a scoring system that's very similar to our uh, media freedom index, so we'll be able to compare um, if there's any differences between press freedom and internet freedom in different countries. Um, in order to do so, we developed a methodology that is divided into different categories, and we've assigned different points to the categories. Uh, the methodology will be, will be published uh, together with our report um, um, early in 2009. And um, just to show here particular uh, kind of general themes that we'll be looking at are limits to content and communication, uh, to violation of rights online, and also op um, obstacles to access, be they infrastructural, uh, government-imposed blocking, um, and also cost of access, um, as well as the legal and regulatory environment, um, both of the internet, mobile phone, um, and other um, ICTs that might emerge. Uh, in terms of limit to content and communication, um, we'll be, our researchers will be using data that's, that's um, available um, by other researchers, um, and as well as doing their own research. Um, we'll be taking into consideration the, the documented filtering of websites that might take place, um, how transparent, if there is censorship, um, it is in a particular country. Is there a due process in place or not? Um, is there self-censorship um, by, um, by bloggers or by others? Um, does the government try to shape um, or control the, the type of content? Um, if there is a, a very diverse type of opinion online or not? And um, how effectively um, the digital media is being used for activism, particularly for mobilization. Um, in terms of violations of, of online rights, particular type of questions that we've asked is um, what type of surveillance is, uh, exists in a particular country, uh, privacy um, and internet, um, what legal protections exist or not related to freedom of expression online, and what are the repercussions for blogs, posts, and other content that's available online. Is there prosecution? Is there imprisonment? Are there physical attacks um, or worse things taking place? Um, again, our study will compose 15 countries um, and a run through um, of the methodology. Um, we, we believe that um, some expected results will be um, a little bit different than what some people um, envision. Um, we found that in some repressive uh, regimes, um, their internet freedom index might be higher which means they'll be uh, freer um, than the traditional press freedom index. Um, our initial kind of test runs and running through the methodology, um, Egypt and China will likely have higher scores, which means be a little bit freer uh, than our traditional press freedom. Um, and that's because of the, the either because they have a, um, an active blogosphere or that in these countries that may be repressive, um, that there's a lot of online mobilization, so the citizens are using it, and that tells us that it's, it's free, at least for discussion. Uh, we hope that the methodology um, uh, will be used for and allow for long-term tracking of interaction between uh, restrictions and for civil society to um, respond. Um, we hope also that it will be a tool to trend. Um, it will be a tool to, to measure trends, whether countries are becoming um, freer on the Internet or not. Um, there's been a trend, um, as I said, uh, over the last couple of years that, that more censorship is taking place. Is that causing countries to be free or not? We'll be able to detect that with our index. Um, we hope that it will be useful for those conducting advocacy. Um, and our narrative reports uh, will be useful uh, to track legal developments 
and we hope that it will also allow users uh, to know whether they need to empower themselves uh, to protect against surveillance um, um, and other issues. Um, as with our existing um, indices and reports, uh, we believe that our Internet Freedom Index will be used uh, for donors and media development um, organizations to identify trends um, on restrictions that might exist in the country, um, as well as possibly be a source um, or indicator uh, for the new global um, network initiative uh, for legislative efforts, uh, such as the Global Online Freedom Act, um, and foreign assistance uh, programs that may be tied to democratic development. Uh, and also it might be useful for companies that they may want to see um, conduct an assessment as to um, issues um, if technology will be deployed in a particular country. Um, so again, I, I thank you very much um, for this presentation. I know that it's been uh, perhaps a little bit fast, but I, um, I look forward to, to the discussion and I look forward to the presentation of my colleagues. Thank you very much. We will have a specific regional uh, analysis looking at the region covered by the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, which represents, you could say, the larger Europe, including Transcaucasus and, uh, and, and large parts of Central Asia. Roland Bless, director of the OSCE's um, Freedom of Expression Division, you have the floor. Good morning. Can you hear me with this microphone? Okay. Uh, let me start by, by giving you a, a quick description of what the OSCE does. Uh, as was said initially, the, the E stands for Europe. However, I believe that the territories which are outside of uh, traditionally defined Europe, uh, such as the former Soviet Union, North America, including um, Alaska, and uh, including the USA and, and Canada, probably make the, the, the parts of the OSCE outside of Europe bigger than the ones within uh, traditional uh, Europe. So it is mainly a, a, a club of countries which has 56 members in the northern uh, hemisphere. And uh, this will be the geographical area that I'm talking about in this uh, presentation. The OSC has uh, three built-in human rights institutions and they are all designed to monitor compliance of the 56 states with their commitments. And uh, this is no small thing if I report to you that 56 governments decided that they might be culpable of violating the commitments that they have given themselves. And therefore this built-in monitoring mechanism allows us to operate as if we were an NGO, but in fact we are intergovernmental. That's uh, the beauty and the curse of it at the same, at the same time. Uh, you might have heard of these institutions. One is based in Warsaw, mainly observing elections. Another one is based in The Hague in the Netherlands, uh, dealing with national minorities. And there is us. We are dealing with the uh, freedom of media issues. Now, the major commitments for freedom of the media, which touch up on the internet, are, are two. Uh, it is the free flow of information. Governments have committed themselves to ensure the free flow of information. That is the, the base, one of the basic commitments come out, coming out of the Helsinki Final Act. And uh, the second one is to proactively promote pluralism. Now, if you look at these commitments, you can clearly see that the Internet is the embodiment of uh, uh, actually enhancing fulfillment with uh, uh, these two uh, commitments. And uh, since all 56 countries are subscribed to the principles of uh, democratic government, democratic elections, etc., you might ask, where is the problem? Uh, we have uh, seen an overview before by, by Robert, which clearly tells you that the region that we are dealing with uh, is not the worst sinful, if I may say so, when it comes to curtailing uh, freedom of expression or freedom of the media uh, on the Internet. Let me still share with you the major uh, problems that uh, we do have. First of all, uh, Internet is controlled. Uh, there is blocking and filtering also within uh, the OSC uh, area. This is not done on a, on a large scale, or maybe I should say this is not yet done on a, on a larger scale. We believe that Internet developed so rapidly that many governments simply couldn't catch up uh, controlling it. And therefore this uh, very special feature that has made Internet 
in many parts of the OSC region the only source of meaningful alternative information. It doesn't even have to be dissident information on anti-government information. It can just be called meaningful alternative information. It's probably the, the, the basic fundamental value that we try to preserve. This is particularly true in uh, Central Asian countries. It is uh, true in uh, some Eastern European uh, states uh, uh, as well. We have taken this issue as a, as a strong component of our office's program as of 2002, uh, what we refer to as the Amsterdam process. Three consecutive uh, conferences were held in, in Amsterdam. They were held in Amsterdam because we were uh, able to use some Dutch funding for these uh, conferences. And uh, these uh, Amsterdam principles are basically the ones that we do uh, promote. Uh, within the OSC area. The conference process itself was also designed to raise awareness amongst uh, participating states that preserving the internet is actually a crucial part of uh, fulfilling the OSC uh, commitments. When it comes to advice or policy, uh, our list is, is a long list of don'ts. Don't block, don't filter, uh, don't interfere, and don't put up new legislation. We believe by and large the legislation in place might be uh, sufficient or is sufficient to also cover uh, the internet. We do, however, have some philosophical uh, differences within the uh, OSCE region, that's, that's well known. There is a different approach to hate speech, for example, uh, what we call the transatlantic uh, divide. Uh, there is a, quite a different approach to, to Nazi content and uh, that is legal in some countries and it's absolutely illegal up to the point where governments intervene and, and, and filter certain sites. This is done openly and transparently. transparently every, everybody knows about it. Still, it is, a, it is a filtering and probably for, for historical reasons, uh, these uh, phenomena will not go away so soon. It is absolutely unconceivable that any politician in Germany will say we stop uh, filtering Nazi content on the website. That would be political suicide. So we do continue to have the situation where you can put up such content uh, in the US, for example, totally legally, and it will be at the same time uh, blocked in, uh, in uh, Germany. If we look at some issues which go beyond the filtering techniques which were described by, by Robert in his uh, introduction, uh, we also have some structural problems which limit access to uh, the internet. First of all, uh, monopolies in telecommunication uh, very often restrict access by either having a low so-called penetration, meaning the, the physical uh, infrastructure is not in place, or simply by demanding high subscription fees. Uh, if you have uh, internet subscription fees of, let's say, $30, 30 euros per month, you automatically limit your audience to a very urban, maybe um, higher educated part of the of the society, whereas uh, a lot of the of the rural population has 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 no access. We do, however, also have uh, very very good examples which counter this trend. For instance, the uh, country of, of Macedonia, former Yugoslav Republic of Macedonia, as is known to few of you, uh, has been wired less completely. That means you have access in in all schools throughout uh, the countries. Uh, how do we go about uh, remedial actions, rectifying things which, uh, which go wrong? We are asked to intervene, that's our tool. Our main addressees, therefore, are governments. We uh, inform them about uh, violations which amount to violating the OSCE uh, commitments. As to what extent these interventions are then followed up upon, that is basically the responsibility of the government. So those governments uh, which want to listen to our interventions, they will uh, act and, and react, and uh, others don't. Uh, you know, if you look at the, the 56 countries that I have described, there are countries uh, amongst the OSC family, the OSC membership, which are clearly marked as unfree by such indexes as, as, as Freedom House. Uh, we do not uh, produce our own indexes, but of course we, we rely heavily on their findings which have uh, become a, a kind of an accepted standard for, for, for indexing these countries. 
Uh, we do, of course, uh, have a, a bit of media development uh, activities, not only monitoring for uh, compliance, but also uh, uh, activities in, in, in promoting uh, Internet as a, a new form of media, so to speak. First of all, we try to add a, a fourth category of journalism to the traditional few which, which do exist, such as, as print, broadcast, and maybe uh, wire, wire journalism. We do believe that internet journalism has become a reality. This should be uh, reflected in uh, how professional associations are structured, how internet journalists are accredited, and uh, how internet journalists are, are given access. Uh, very often uh, accreditation is not only a, a so-called favor granted by authorities, but it is at the same time a means of, of, of controlling access to information. Uh, very often it is referred to as privileges. We do not believe that an accreditation is a privilege. Uh, accreditation is a basic right of a person seeking to uh, represent the, the public's right uh, uh, to know. Uh, this is a discussion which is going on in Belarus right now and uh, we try to uh, be uh, uh, very uh, active uh, in, in, in promoting a, a pro-media uh, approach to these uh, things. We do have another uh, instrument at disposal, so-called legal reviews. As soon as a piece of legislation is uh, enacted, initiated, debated, proposed by a government, by a parliamentary body or a parliament as a whole, sometimes even uh, reacting up on civil society, uh, proposals. We offer to have this piece reviewed by an international media uh, legal expert team just for compliance with international standards. Especially when you look at such uh, very complicated uh, and technologically sensitive issues like uh, digital terrestrial broadcasting or also uh, the internet, uh, this assistance is very often uh, accepted uh, gladly by, by parliamentary uh, bodies, which does not always mean that the recommendations are then uh, translated into a political or, or, or legal uh, reality. And the uh, last point I would like to, to stress is that we do promote internet journalism as a, as a new form of journalism by, by supporting uh, trainings. This is done uh, jointly with uh, our so-called field operations. Uh, the OSE has the luxury, I should say, of being presented in up to 20 countries with field presences, field uh, operations. These are so-called field missions which have between five and maybe eight or nine hundred people which are just local experts on the ground which help transformation societies, transformation uh, governments to come to grips with their commitments that they have as uh, OSC participating states. I thank you for your attention. I'm looking forward to the uh, discussion or questions that you might have later on. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much, uh, Roland. We will continue this Google Earth flying uh, trip and uh, now focus on, on one country. I'm going to hand over the, uh, the floor to, to Isaac Mao, or I should maybe say www.isaacmao.com, because Isaac was known probably as the, the first blogger in China. He is now a research fellow at the Bergman Center at Harvard University in, uh, in the U.S., but still very active in the discussions in that very rich and very complex internet society that uh, exists in China. Isaac, the floor is yours. Thank you. It's free expression in China, you know, because it's a very complicated story there and happening every day. Because uh, just in this week that um, the, the, the Authority has put a lot of uh, news website back to the censorship, uh, uh, which were uh, said that has been released during the Olympic Games. So many people reported online on their blogs and Twitter sphere to share their findings that which website has been uh, reblogged, you know, in this country. And I thought that is something. Uh, we can start to talk today, you know, because um, I think um, there are a lot of people, you know, talk about the censorship system in China, but uh, we have to study why people there, you know, are used to be, are used to be controlled, and why the authority, what's their mentality, you know, to control the internet in their own harsh way of not so polite, you know, as we imagine, you know. 
all the time, but how the Chinese bloggers and how the grassroots forces are starting to find their own way of um, to create their self-organized internet governance um, scenarios in this country. So I am trying to argue, you know, in my maybe research that the tradition, the culture, and the educational system and people's mentality in China, you know, um, they are playing a very important role in, in this uh, governance landscape, you know, and, and the social media, the emerging social media in China with f over 40 million bloggers in this country now are uh, pushing this scenario to an optimistic uh, future. That's my argument, you know, in these days. Since last, uh, let me check back to my personal, you know, history of um, uh, fighting with censorship in China. Um, actually, I uh, developed my own learning software since 10 years ago um, to support the Chinese people to learn knowledge online and with the new internet and uh, communication tools. But I found that the technology is not the simple, simple thing, the only simple thing that to help people to learn. So I back to the fundamental theories of uh, pedagogy and educational theories. I learned a lot about uh, the brain, techno uh, brain theory, uh, how people perceive the world and how they construct their knowledge space in their mind and how they share with other people. So in the simply model, simplified brain model of censorship. I think because people, there are a lot of uh, internal circles in our mind and the, the neurons connected to each other. So we, that, that kind of uh, parallel computing can form our daily thinking and make, helping us make decisions. But there are many blocks in our internal circles as well because of the educational system, because of the cultural context, because of the commercial context. You know, we actually, as an adult, you know, we, we, we have a lot of blocks in our neuron circles already with different kinds of uh, blocks. So actually, we are becoming less smarter with so many blocks in our, in our brain. And this system, you know, uh, in our brain, you know, can prevent us from thinking smarter. So actually, I summarized our prob the problem of free expression and freedom of uh, internet into three categories. The first one is called free access. It happens in so many countries. And uh, I think there are less country, um, very few country have really pure in free internet today around the world. So it's um, totally a global phenomenon now. And the second problem is free thinking because of those educational established educational system uh, with very out of fashion uh, uh, course curriculums and some of the training methods. So people were educated to think in the, in the way I mentioned just now. They, they, they build their own blocks in their brains so people cannot think freely. And uh, it prevent us, prevent them from free sharing on the internet as well, even to their social context. So it's a, it's a, it, it can be summarized into a self-censorship problem. And the third category can be, say, uh, uh, can be seen as the uh, very obvious problems we can see uh, everywhere today is the free speech problems involved in many political and media control uh, uh, phenomenon, but these um, uh, uh, very apparent, you know, problems we can see. We, we have to track back to many internal reasons. Um, so these three walls, you know, uh, actually uh, we can see everywhere around the world. And in China is very typical because we have a, a famous great firewall system to, to prevent from people from free expression online and uh, try to um, build a frame, framework for other people as a net nanny, you know, that the government tried to become the r moral, you know, uh, standard of the whole country uh, as they did before to the traditional media. So the thinking models in China is a very interesting topic I did 
uh, in my research in the past several years. But compare, oh, there are some uh, positions now, so accurate. Uh, so actually, if you study, Chi if you want to study Chinese internet sphere, try to get a really understanding of this society, you have to try to divide people into several categories, like um, from silence, keep silencing, you know, to free thinking and free speech. You know, uh, there's, there are over 200 million internet users already in China, but uh, most of the, them, you know, are, are still 